I'd just like to briefly introduce myself. Um, we're coming to you from, from Darwin in the Northern Territory of Australia. Uh, I'm Dr. Steve Reynolds. I'm a lecturer and uh, researcher here at Charles Darwin University. And I'm a zoologist. Uh, my main interest is actually in, in amphibians, um, but I am uh, work on ecology and also uh, physiology, so ecophysiology. And of course, I have an interest in biogeography because of the region we're in, in Australia, particularly close to Southeast Asia. And also have a bit of interest in taxonomy. And I'd also like to introduce. Yep, I'm uh, Professor Keith Christian, and uh, I'm a zoologist here, also a zoologist here at Charles Darwin University. My research interests are with amphibians and reptiles, so physiology, physiology and ecology. But of course, uh, evolution is, a, is the background for all of that, and it's sort of the backbone of all the research we do. I've had a long standing interest in, in Darwin and evolution. Uh, in fact, I uh, did my PhD research work in, in the Galapagos Islands way back in the late 1970s. And so I'm really uh, pleased to be here and help see that today. Okay, so as most of you have realized by now, the course is really composed of four parts. So hopefully you've had a little bit of a look around the site um, and particularly noted um, part one this week. So what we'll do with the webinar is each Friday we'll have a webinar and we'll focus on that part. So this week we're going to focus on part one. At the end of next week on Friday we'll focus on part two and so on. So this week obviously we want to talk about uh, the life of Charles Darwin. So with the webinars, um, so a few things we'd like to do. Firstly, uh, just talk about some points of interest relating to part one, so hopefully you've already read through part one on the quiz and so on, and we'll just um, cover some other points of interest, maybe some things we didn't cover necessarily in part one. Also want to provide some opportunities to interact and participate, so uh, we'll have some questions, so you can respond to those questions with polling, and also a bit of live chat, so you can send us some chat at any time, and we'll be monitoring that uh, during the webinar. So. And the other thing we'd like to do is that we've had some discussions on the discussion forum this week, and we'd like to look at some of the items and, and some of the issues and so on that can come, come out of that discussion forum. So, uh, just while we're on that, so hopefully, I think most people have figured this out already, but you can communicate using the chat. And so, um, use, the, use the chat box there to. Um, to, to write anything and press enter when you want to send a bit of chat and we'll keep an eye on that. The other thing is for the polling, so what we'll do is we'll have a couple of questions, some activities during the webinar and to participate go to the box so you can see here there's a, there's a menu and there's a polling response box there and actually most of ours will be uh, you know, multiple choice, so A, B, C or A, B, C, D. So give us your response, we'll give you a little bit of time to respond uh, and then we'll publish the, the responses to see what people think. Alright, so what have we covered uh, this week? So uh, hopefully people have looked at the timeline, so we've had um, Darwin's life, his early life, uh, the Voyage of the Beagle, traveling around the world, and also when he came back um, from his journey. We've also had some readings from the Journal of Researchers, so part of that is um, fossil uh, megafauna that Darwin found, but also his description of the Galapagos, so the islands, the landscapes, and some of the animals and so on. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Galapagos in part two, so next week. Um, and the other thing is the people voyages and how Port Darwin and Darwin where we are came to be named. So hopefully everyone's had a look at that. Um, one thing we just wanted to say was that um, there's a lot of books available on Darwin. Um, one thing, one that I would particularly recommend is this one, which is um, Charles Darwin, uh, part of the Very Interesting People series. So he was a very interesting person. And it's written by Adrian Desmond, James Moore, and Janet Brown. So they're all uh, very well, well-renowned uh, Darwin scholars. 
So for a short, uh, readable introduction, and this one is interesting in terms of the sort of the social uh, context as well, to what was happening at the time in England. Um, I definitely recommend this one. It's easy to get hold of. You can just order it online or whatever. Okay, you can have yep. I'd like to recommend one, uh, a different one. It's uh, different, but, but similar in some ways. Also very uh, concise. In fact, it's so concise that it has concise in the title. The title is Charles Darwin, The Concise Story of an Extraordinary Man. And that's by Professor Tim Barra. And uh, Tim Barra is at uh, Ohio State University. But he spent quite a bit of time here in Darwin, both at the museum in Darwin and more recently at the uh, Charles Darwin University. So it's a, it's a good overview, very readable, lots of nice uh, illustrations and pictures. And so it's a very good way to, to get a lot of information about Darwin very quickly. And Tim gives an interesting lecture on Charles Darwin as well, which is available um, online. You can, you can find that. And there's a link to it on, on the link. So we thought we would start. Uh, so we want to test out this the polling. Um, so what we would like is, um, the question is, can you repeat the, the, the author? Oh, so we've had, a, we've had a question okay. here. OK, I'll, I'll repeat the, the, the uh, concise story of an extraordinary man. Tim Berra, B-E-R-R-A, B-E-R-R-A. Yeah. I think maybe they're asking about both of them. I'm asking about this one as well. This one is just called Charles Darwin um, by Adrian Desmond, James Moore, and Janet Brown. And it's part of the very interesting people series by Oxford University Press. So it's published in England by Oxford University Press. All right, so um, we'll try as the first the first poll. So this is just sort of a general question about Darwin. Um, I guess in a way, if you thought, you know, if I was Darwin, um, which part of which part of his life do you think would appeal to the most, which would be the most interesting or exciting, which would interest you? Um, so see, so Darwin lived for quite a while he lived until he was he's 73 years old. Um, the voyage was an important part in the middle there, uh, five years from from 1831 to 1836. Um, so really, which period of Darwin's life do you think, would you, you know, rather be out adventuring in South America or would you be sort of like to be comfortable in a town house? Or, you know, maybe, maybe his early life was quite, uh, quite interesting. So people have um, made some votes. We'll give you a few more seconds. So five second warning. Oh, the time is timed out. Four, three, okay. So. Let's see what people people thought. So there's some responses. So we've got what have we got? Many Looks like the Beatles. Beatles done pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So a few people like the early life. Um, well, okay. Um, I think so. This is um, so. Darwin obviously went to to Edinburgh. And, and sort of tried to study there for a while. And then this is uh, Cambridge, and we can actually see Darwin's room up here, where he stayed at, at Cambridge. Um, he, I think he had a fairly probably enjoyable time there. He didn't have to study too hard, really. Um, we've been quite a comfortable guy. He learned a few things. Um, I think he met things well, so that would have been definitely influential. And I think maybe it's a period when he's. Um, he started to collect beetles and so on, and, and natural history actually started to come up with suit. He realised it was a thing that he was really interested in, and I think he finally, finally recognised that. Um, so, in a way, it would have been, would have been a nice time of his life. Um, so, a lot of people have said the voyage. Uh, I think the voyage would have been interesting, but I guess I'd like to point out that um, Darwin was stuck in this little cabin for most of the voyage. And it didn't have a lot of room. He could barely stand up in it because uh, it was, you know, it had low ceilings under the food deck. He had to share it with two other people, um, sleeping in his hammock at night, and then and that's where he did um, a lot of his reading and so on. And, you know, the cabin didn't have a window or anything like that. Um, I think it would have been interesting for him, but, you know, there were certain, certain privations. Yep. Another aspect of the voyage for Darwin was that he was seasick pretty much the whole time. A lot of people get seasick early in the voyage and they get used to it. And 
sort of get over it. Yeah. Uh, he never got over it. So uh, I think he spent a lot of time uh, feeling pretty miserable on, on that time. But there was a, a, a positive aspect to that, and that was that he took the opportunity to get off the vehicle every chance he did. Every chance he had, and he spent quite a bit of time, particularly in South America, traveling overland by horseback, um, hired horses or, or borrowed horses, and and he would uh, arrange to meet the people that are maybe in a different port or maybe at the same port at a different time. And he actually spent weeks and weeks, and in some cases even months, uh, traveling around. And, and of course, this is when he did. A lot of, made a lot of observations, did a lot of his collecting plants and animals and rock, rocks, um, so he did geology, botany, and zoology. And, um, and he also witnessed a lot of things. He saw a volcano erupting in South America and he witnessed quite a large earthquake. And so these, these were all really important events that he would have missed out on if he sort of stayed on the beagle. Stayed at home. Or stayed at home, yeah, either stayed at home or stayed on the beagle. Yeah. Uh, and I think the other thing, I'm putting, <laughs> this is a, a, um, an example of the sorts of things that people used to do on ships in those days. This is a, a ship in a bottle. And these things are very hard to create. They're very meticulous. They take very long periods of time. And one thing he had on the voyage was lots of time to think and to read and to do lots of stuff. It took, particularly if you think about the days of sailing, uh, voyages took a really long time. So he had all that time on the voyage just to, you know, think about things and ponder and read and, and do all that sort of stuff. So uh, I think I think that was, was pretty pretty important time and, and you know would have been really interesting for him. And here we can see how he, he travelled around the world and as Pete mentioned, uh, you know, he, he went to a lot of places, experienced a lot of things. Uh, and something else we point out here is the uh, the Galapagos. So that was obviously very important. But also there's one other place that, well, he did visit Australia down here and he did visit New Zealand, but um, yeah, he never never actually made it to the, to the tropical Australia, to, to where Darwin City is, and that was, of course, the, the Port Darwin or the Harbour of Darwin was named in his honour. On the subsequent voyage, there was still a lot of, of the same crew, um, and the surveyor on that crew was um, named Stokes, and he actually named Darwin Harbour. In honor of, uh, in, in honor of Darwin. And of course, there, uh, in fact, there are a lot of places around Darwin Harbor that are named. There's a Stokes Hill Wharf, and there's a Stokes, there's a Wickham. Uh, yeah. Is it the Charles Point? I think it's also named after Darwin. There's a Bino Harbor. All of those are uh, yeah. people that are on, on the people. So there's quite a bit of uh, legacy, and we'll talk more about that legacy uh, in uh, part four. Yeah. So Darwin did go to, to Sydney here and to Tasmania and to King George's Sound down the bottom in South Western Australia. But yeah, that, that voyage of the Beagle didn't go anywhere near Northern Australia. And really there wasn't probably a lot, um, no real settlements or anything up in the Northern Australia at that time anyway. So, so then Darwin uh, really spent the rest of his life at Denham House. And I think, you know, that was probably would have been reasonably comfortable there. Uh, he had everything he needed. He had his family, he spent time with his children. He could go for walks in the country. And there was a country planned in Denbury. Um, he could spend time reading and pondering and writing letters and, and, and writing books as well. Um, so I think that would have been a fairly, fairly comfortable time and they were reasonably well off. Must be house. You know, I don't think life would have been terribly hard for him. So in a way that, that, um, that period would have been would have been quite good too. So, a next question then. So, thinking more about really the theory in terms of evolutionary theory, natural selection, these ideas of like, divergence and so on. Um, again, thinking about these three periods of his life, early life, the voyage, so he's exploring the world and so on, geologizing, uh, botanizing, all those sorts of things that he did. Um, and then after the voyage, so when he's actually publishing, um, you know, thinking a lot and, and writing, corresponding with everybody uh, and people all around the world, uh, he wrote, you know, literally thousands of letters. Um, so what do people think in terms of, um, in terms actually the development of his theory or theories really, in terms of sexual selection and, and the other things as well. So 
know, you develop the whole body of knowledge, really. Um, what do people think in terms of uh, which, which period there would be, would be most important? And so we've got some responses, so we give the, the five second warning. Most people five, four, three, two, or then go on the time now. So let's see what people thought about that. Yeah, well, obviously there's um, uh, no right, right or wrong answer to all of that. Uh, I mean, he, his, uh, his early life sort of prepared him for the voids. I mean, he, he didn't just go as a passenger. He was selected to go as, as the naturalist. So he had to have some uh, preparation for that. So it's a friend. And then, of course, the voids was, was really, uh, you know, where he's going to solve the world and all the diversity of plants and animals in the world and, and the, uh, the geology. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think so. Um, the, the voyage is obviously important. I think this is a quote from, from his autobiography, and that's why he said the voyage has been the most important event in my life and has deserved my whole career. So, but yeah, I mean, in order to get there, he's got to have to recommend him. So I guess yeah. in a way you could, you could say that was, that was pretty important. And he has some education at Cambridge, but um, he says the real training and education of a mind happened during the voyage, so he got some education at Cambridge, but obviously it wasn't enough. Um, and also, so he talks about several branches of natural history, so, um, you know, botanizing, geologizing, as we mentioned, um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about his, he mentions there about his powers of observations, and this next slide is uh, from the cabinet at Down House. And they have some examples there of some things. Here's uh, a copy of the principles of geology, so Lyle's principles, which Darwin read on the voyage and then received the other volumes uh, as he was traveling around. So that was very important. He spent a lot of time reading that. Um, so that would be important. There's Darwin's uh, dissecting instruments down here. So, you know, he had his tweezers and he had his little um, scalpels and so on. So he'd actually get specimens and dissect them and then look at things very closely. He had this little device here, which is kind of neat, which is a uh, pocket microscope. And there's its case. And on the top here is a little uh, magnifying glass. And then here, you can put your specimen on the little ledge there. And you can get specimens and look at them in the field and so on. So that was really handy. And he also had things, you know, telescopes, so he could keep an eye out. Um, so he had, you know, and he, as he said, it really helped develop his observational skills, and he really became a naturalist, and not only that, a well-traveled naturalist, you know, one that, that, um, that knew a lot about other places in the world from from experience, you know, not just from reading it somewhere, but actually from experience. Lastly, um, Down House. So I guess that was fairly important. Uh, so this is uh, the sand book, so Darwin's thinking park. So we used to wander around it. Um, walk around several times and, you know, ponder on various things. Yeah. So obviously this part of his life is really important. I mean, it, it's not as if on the voyage he had an epiphany and all of a sudden he thought about yeah. evolution by natural selection. He, it was a very much a gradual process. He, he gathered information. He, he found out lots of things. He saw lots of things on the voyage. Mm -hmm. But it was only in about 18 months or two years after he returned from the voyage he first wrote uh, something about his initial thoughts about um, uh, evolution, or they call it transmutation. Transmutation, the yeah. time transmutation. What he was talking about was evolution. So that was came a year and a half or two years later. And it was really uh, another, I think, about seven years before he started writing about uh, the mechanism of that, that is, evolution by natural selection. So his time or walking around the, the sand path and, and thinking, obviously, and, and doing experiments on uh, um, initially a, a lot of things. Well, initially, uh, a lot of the, he worked on the materials that he brought back from the, from the voids, but then he started working on barnacles and then later uh, plants and, yeah. and, other, and pigeons and all sorts of other animals. But, uh, uh, so it was really very much a gradual process, and he was a very, uh, he, I think he really wanted to have a lot of evidence before he put it forward, and so it took, he spent 20 years really getting it. Accumulating, accumulating evidence, that's right. So yeah, he had lots of time to think and 
to write. He had his, his study set up so he could, uh, could write all his letters, his correspondence, as I mentioned, you know, thousands of letters over those periods. So that was a time when he was really bringing all that information together. And it's just amazing to me the number of publications he had, all that information that he put into those publications. So how did he order it? How did he keep it all together so he knew everything? He had a really good filing system or yeah. and got an amazing brain to just remember all these individual details that he put in all these little bits of evidence. Well, he didn't have a work pass very well. <laughs> he didn't have a filing system on his computer or something like that. I mean, he just, you know, it was all on this paper and um, so, yeah, it's just amazing that he really managed to all that, so, such a diverse array of information and evidence that he brought together. Um, really, really impressive. So I think that's pretty important. Now, one thing that we've, um, we hadn't really mentioned was, was Darwin's illness. And uh, Darwin did have, and so this was really that period when he came back and was living in Downer House, and he had really serious health issues um, for, for many, many years. And, um, you know, all these symptoms, um, you know, he had terrible trouble feeling really sick, and um, he tried uh, various treatments and so on. So, so uh, yeah, there were this, there's been a lot of speculation about what, what mm -hmm. that illness was. And then he first uh, became active, uh, became ill on a couple of those overland voyages, one in Argentina and then uh, I think again in Brazil. He got quite sick. And, and so there, that, that bug that, that was on the last slide is uh, a bug called the uh, assassin bug, or it's got a couple of different names. It is, it's, a bug, it's a blood sucking bug that attacks people in South America usually when they're at night when they're sleeping, sucks their blood, and it transmits a protozoan that causes a disease called Chagas disease. The, the protozoan is called the trypanosoma. And like a lot of the uh, protozoan diseases, they can be very persistent, like malaria. It can, you know, it can last a lifetime. And uh, Chagas disease is, is, is one of those sort of lifelong illnesses. So that's, some people think it may, may have been Chagas disease. Um, but not everybody's convinced because the, the symptoms are, I mean, the, the, that disease has a variety of symptoms, but it's not a clear, clear cut case. Yeah, there's a definite show. It's, uh, you know, sort of that, sort of like that, but not necessarily. So other people have speculated that uh, his illness was really, really related to stress, related to his controversial ideas. You know, in other words, he was sort of dreading the backlash that, um, that might come, and, and to some extent did, did come during his lifetime. Um, and so maybe that, that um, may have just been stress. And then there's a third uh, line of thought, is that it was self-induced because of his desire to be left alone. In other words, just he wanted to stay at Down House. He, wasn't, he really didn't want to be in the limelight, do his work, stay with his family. He was very much a family man. And... Um, so I don't think anybody was uh, in any place suggesting that he was faking it. And as, as Tim Bear points out in his in his book, uh, that these are not mutually exclusive. And so he, he may well have had some tropical Chagas disease or some other tropical disease. The stress made that work worse. And he certainly was very protective about his time uh, in his later years. And so it's, it, it may well have been a, a combination of that. Uh, so what, what do people think there on that? We've had a, a few responses there. Actually, I noticed there's someone uh, someone in the chat who suggested this no um, all of the above button. Yeah. <laughs> so perhaps we, we could have we should have had an option D there yeah. to suggest that uh, all of the above. So okay, maybe that's, maybe that's what people selected. That, that part of it. So a lot of people have gone with the show his disease, and yeah, it is. Seems so, but I guess at the time when no one could really, um, there was probably no doctor in England or who would, would have known enough to actually be able to yeah. diagnose that and say, well, this is that disease because it was such an unusual thing and, you know, not many people went to South America and, and, and travelled there and so on. So that people just didn't know what it was, probably. Yeah, yeah so unfortunately, we'll probably never know the answer to that question, but uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe just. The missing D, all of your love, is, is probably the best might answer. Be the one. <laughs> might be the best answer. So, yeah, and obviously there was a bit of his, his stress with um, his belief, I suppose, and, and him obviously was still 
very firm believer in standing and so on. So uh, that probably would have. Um, yeah, what, one, one of the uh, bits of evidence, there's actually been a, a book written about that. Specifically. Yeah, specifically. One, and Tim Barrett talks about that idea in his book about one sort of bit of circumstantial evidence that, that uh, might support the stress the stress related answers is that uh, in his later years, at least in the scientific community, his ideas were pretty well accepted in his later years. And, and his, his health actually got improved uh, as he got older. And so maybe he sort of weathered that storm and, and uh, the idea and, and you know uh, he, a lot of he didn't actually the, although the controversy continued and continues today but he had other you know Hux, Huxley and other colleagues that actually took up the fight on his behalf and so he was pretty much sort of left to, the, yeah. or to some extent left out of that the worst of that anyway mm -hmm. and continue with the pursuits. Yeah, the analysis right. He didn't really leave the house that much, and he didn't get involved terribly much in, the, in all the controversy that followed, particularly the publication of the Origin, wasn't it? Yeah. So, uh, one more question we thought, and so in terms of Darwin, so we mentioned that he travelled around, uh, he became, you know, some say became the, the complete naturalist in terms of he had an interest in a whole range of different things, and I think. It's interesting to think that in those days, uh, people could really encompass uh, almost, you know, all of which was known type of thing. Like they read widely and so on, they could understand geology, they could understand uh, whole areas of zoology, they could, uh, even things like meteorology were, were part of natural history. Um, astronomy to a certain extent, although that was a bit specialised, a bit of its own thing. But it was all part of natural history. And so these people were doing natural science, who are doing natural history, didn't necessarily think of themselves as scientists and stuff, certainly not in the ways we think of scientists these days. And uh, it was, I mean, not easy, but easier to be a generalist in those days. These days when everything's very specific, you know, you work on a specific organism or you work in a specific area of science. Uh, science is so broad and so massive, you know, biology is just an enormous field. Uh, thousands of different uh, scientific journals, uh, it's just it's basically impossible to keep abreast of absolutely everything. But Darwin um, did use lots of different types of evidence, and as we mentioned, he accumulated evidence over time. The whole time he was writing and keeping notes in his diary and, and um, you know, notebooks books and all those sorts of things. So, uh, just a sort of general question then about, you know, what, what, what type of evidence? So, acknowledging that, um, you know, it's a combination of those things, so that that would be the option. Uh, and acknowledging that, um, what do you think, what are the sort of types of evidence that are really, really important in, uh, in developing the evolutionary theory? So, we've had some responses, we give them the five second warning. Five, four, oh, no, my timing is out. My timing is terrible. So, let's see what, what people think about that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, I, I, I would agree with that. Pretty much agree with that. Definitely between zoology and geology. Right. Um, he, uh, Darwin became, oh, um, he obviously was a bit of a botanist. He collected a lot of plant mm -hmm. uh, specimens during the voyage. Yeah. Um, but, and then later in life, uh, he, he published books and books uh, and, you know, on orchids and on climbing plants and, and, and did a lot of botany. But that was really after that was after the theory had been put out in his later years, like in the, in the 1870s, he really became um, much of a botanist. So zoology and geology, he was always a zoologist, that, and uh, both of those um, you know, fields are very important to him. It's interesting to note that um, when he came back from the voyage, he farmed out a lot of his uh, specimens to the specialists, John Gould got the birds, other people got the mammals and fish and amphibians. He kept the plants, so I guess that some of the artists said he wasn't interested in botany then, but he kept the plants, all the invertebrate animals, and the rocks. So again, he, he, A, B, and C, he was really brought, brought across the yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I probably would have gone, I probably would have gone to all of this number one. I mean, that, that's probably because that's, that's my preference, but I think 
he was really interested in animals. He started looking at invertebrates when he was young. He was interested in birds. Uh, and a lot of his explanations are used, you know, like he talks about domesticated animals. So he was breeding pigeons, all those sorts of things. So, so I see the comment here about the finches stood out. And that the finches were obviously very important, but it's interesting that it took him a while to realize how important the finches were because uh, when he, co he collected finches and, and other members of the crew collected finches, he didn't actually even record which islands the finches came from. So he collected a bunch of islands and all, it was years later, uh, so he, he gave the finches to, to John Gould to, to, he didn't recognize them as finches. He didn't even think they were finches. He called them different, different things. John Gould pointed out, oh, these are all finches. Yeah. And uh, he went back, had to go back to, um, to the, the, the captain's history, yeah, sort of notes, yeah. to, to sort out which islands the different uh, finches came from. And so the finches are very, obviously very important to his, to his theory, felt in his theory, but uh, it took him a while to realize that. Yeah, it certainly right. wasn't something that, that jumped at him. Yeah, and then Fitzroy had better notes than he did in terms of which island they come from. He didn't really know, know which island they'd come from. Yeah. So he wasn't thinking in those terms at all. I thought he was taking very specific notes about this came from this island. Yeah. So that was um, actually there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting caveat to that I was reading recently that suggests that actually some of the features, or all of them just might not be features, but they might actually be closely related to tanagers. Which is a related group of birds in South America, but let's not go there. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention is let's not forget the barnacles, uh, because Darwin spent about eight years uh, describing every known species of barnacle, looking at fossil barnacles. And yeah, this was great. And the introduction of taxonomy, he took a whole group and studied it in great detail. He might have spent a little bit longer than he planned. Um, yeah, I think the barnacles were, were really uh, important too. Uh, and one of the things that we'll talk about in part two next week when we start looking at the mechanisms of evolution is the fact that there's variation uh, within a species. And so we all recognize that people all look different, but we we probably consider that all barnacles of, of a particular species are all pretty much the same. Some might be a bit bigger than others. But when you start looking at them and spend eight years looking at them, like Darwin did, you realize that even within the species, there's a lot of variation. And so that is the sort of evidence that he was, he was collecting over, over his uh, you know, long career. Yeah. So the other thing is, is, is really the geology. And I think someone's mentioned there about his ideas on the growth of atolls. So that's right. He, he actually published, he was a member of the Geological Society. He published a range of articles. He published the geological researches from, from the voyage of the Beagle in, in several volumes. So he had theories on uh, coral reef growth. He had, he, he had um, publications on volcanic islands because they visited a lot of volcanic islands. And he also had a lot to say about uh, the geological structures of South America and so on. So in some ways, at least initially, you know, he was a geologist in a lot of ways. Um, I think one thing I just sort of wanted to point out was, so this is a... a an aerial view of, uh, of South America. And there you can see the Andes Mountains along the west coast. And one of his theories was this incremental upthrust theory. And having seen uh, so the volcano and then the earthquake in Concepcion, and he, he saw places there where the coast had been lifted. In some cases, just by a few feet, but in some cases, you know, more several meters or you know, ten feet, this sort of thing. And in some cases, with shells still attached. Uh, to the rocks that have been lifted out of the... And so, I think, as he mentions here, it's hardly possible to doubt that this great elevation has been affected by successive small uprisings. And he was a, you know, part of this was this incremental theory that this had happened in small stages, but also it would have made him think during the voyage, you know, gosh, that must have taken a long time because the earthquake happened when he was there. No one could remember an earthquake like that in living history, so you think that might happen every few hundred years. And if that rises, you know, a couple of meters, if the Andes themselves are several thousand meters high, you're starting to think about at least hundreds of thousands of years at the very least. And in actual fact, now, you know, we think the Andes is probably 10 million years old or possibly older. So, so you're starting to think about periods of time. But the other thing was that you um, noticed a lot of uh, fossils. Yeah, so as, as he traveled in there, and he, went, he didn't go all the way to the top of the Andes, but he went pretty high up. 
and he found marine fossils, as I've just brought my crop for the days, of, and ammonite. I've only got a little shell, I've got a little fossil yeah. shell here. So he found marine fossils and other kinds of fossils like petrified wood and other things that were up, obviously had been under the sea at some stage, all the way up to um, as high as 7,000 feet. So for those of you in, in Australia, that's roughly the height of Mount Kosciuszko, the highest point in Australia. So as you can imagine, going up to the snowfields and Mount Kosciuszko and finding marine fossils, and not just one or two, but lots of them. And, old, old fossils. Yes, and, and not just laying there, but layers of them. And so this obviously uh, was very important to his thinking. He realized, like he said, that the Earth was pretty old, maybe a lot older than a lot of people were thinking at the time, and that it was dynamic. Things were changing. Things were moving around. That's, yeah, and, and these the geological ideas, I think, so, as I say, he was, he was very much a gradualist. I think those ideas, and also sort of came into his evolutionary theory as well. So. Yeah. so I've got the question about what was his take on plate tectonics. I don't think we know the answer to that specifically. I mean, I think the important bit, the important information that he did get was that it was dynamic. Things were changing. So I don't think if somebody had, if someone had, I think the, the idea of plate tectonics came much later. Much later, yeah. yeah. But if somebody had explained it, had shown it to him, he wouldn't have said, oh, that's crazy. I think he would, you know, he would have thought, wow, that, that really explains a lot. He might have at least considered it. He yeah. would have definitely thought about it. It wasn't really until the 1930s that they you know, talked about plate tectonics, and much later that, that became widely accepted. Yeah. So that was a long time after, after Darwin's time. Okay, so. We have had some um, some discussions on the forum, and that's great. We've had a few people uh, talk about a few things that um, may be important to mention down as well, but maybe we didn't mention on the timelines or that we haven't gone into. Um, one of them was uh, Erasmus, his grandfather, so not, not the brother Erasmus, the other one. And so Darwin would have read uh, Zoonomia when he was young, um, and there was talk in there about um, some evolutionary laws, anyway, some of the evolutionary ideas, maybe that you know, things could change, So, which was actually unusual at the time. Uh, so even the possibility that could happen, maybe, maybe thought Darwin, and you know, they were, they were um, a family of free thinkers, so they were starting to think of, of new ideas and outside sort of the establishment. So uh, the Zoonomia was important. Uh, some people have mentioned the Plinian Society when Darwin was at Edinburgh, and so this was a group where they would get together and talk about you know, items of, of natural science and read papers. And so I guess maybe that helped um, maybe his first his first paper was read before the Fenian Society, so you know that was his first entree, I guess. So that, that perhaps was um was important it's been a few people mentioned that. Uh, and the other one at Edinburgh was was Robert Grant, who was um, interested in marine invertebrates and sponges, but generally um, Darwin was collecting um, collecting marine invertebrates from the, the Firth of Forth, so the estuary at Edinburgh there, and, and so he started his interest there in natural history as well. Um, another one is that's come up several times is the death of, of Annie Darwin, and so uh, this has been depicted in a, in a movie, or this has been an important thing in this movie creation, I'm not sure if they did that a little bit, but basically Annie was his oldest daughter, and she lived until, so she, she died when she was 10 years old, and I think it had a particularly strong effect on Darwin because, um, you know, she was very lively, she was full of life, um, you know, maybe his favourite daughter, I don't know. Um, well, she died of tuberculosis, I think. Well, she got a fever and, and she just she never recovered. And so other, his other, um, had other children that did die, but I think this was, Particularly bad. First, she lived for 10 years, and you know, she looked like she'd survive. Um, he took it particularly badly, and I think he was already losing his sort of belief uh, in a sense. And I think that was some people think that that was like the, the final straw for Darwin. It's like there's, there's, you know, there's no merciful anything. This is just, you know, life is just as it is. Um, something I thought that um, was important that maybe didn't come out that much was, was Darwin's father, and someone mentioned that. You know, allowed him to go on the voyage, and I suppose he did. But also, I think financially, um, supporting Darwin, you know, he actually paid for him to go on the voyage. He was sending him money so he could travel. When he came back, 
Uh, he gave you money to help you buy down the house. You know, he's basically supporting the whole time. So if his father hadn't been, you know, well off, um, you know, a doctor, then I don't think Darwin would have had the life that he had. Yeah, uh, yeah. His father allowed him, but it was, uh, it was only after uh, his father he put the proposal to his father, and his father said, "Well, you can show, get the word of one good man who mm-hmm. said this is a really good idea, and no. I'll, I'll I'll agree to it." And, and Darwin went to his uncle, who was. Uh, Josiah Winston, I think, uh, definitely a Wedgwood, and uh, his, um, his, his uncle and his father were, you know, had, uh, held each other in high regard, and so uh, his uncle thought it was a great idea, and so his uncle wrote, wrote a letter to Darwin's father, and that was the sort of deal. I think he realized that Darwin, you know, that's really what he wanted to do, and that's where his passion lay, so um, his father wanted him to do medicine, he wanted to He'll do something useful with his life, I suppose. So he's a bit of a wayward child, perhaps. Um, so the other ones I just sort of wanted to mention briefly was was Darwin's brother Rad. So when they were young, you know, they used to do some experiments in chemistry and so on. Maybe that helped Darwin get a little interest in experiments in science. But also later in London, um, his, his brother introduced him to certain aspects of London society, which might have made Darwin, you know, he wondered about the sorts of conversations that people might have had, you know, about society and about how things were changing, you know, the whole, um, you know, a lot of things were changing in the world at that time, so that I think also would have had a, a bit of influence. And lastly, early on, uh, William Fox um, got Darwin interested in collecting beetles, and beetles became an absolute fascination for Darwin, it came, you know, he probably should have been studying, he was out collecting beetles. And this is interesting too because when we look at Wallace in part three, he also was a very avid beetle collector, so it must have been quite thin for people to be into um, collecting beetles. Well, one, one thing about, this, about beetles is they're fairly, must, well, they come in all sizes, but a lot of them are reasonably good size, and not necessarily have to have a microscope to look at. But they're incredibly diverse, yeah. and, they're, to, and they're, even in England, where, which is not the, you know, the hot spot of diversity in the world, but there are a lot of beetles everywhere, and so it's uh, it gives I think having an appreciation of that early on probably uh, you know, influenced him later in life to see how diverse life is on Earth. That's right, that whole idea of diversity. And then when he went to the tropics, uh, he would have been absolutely amazed to see how many beetles were there and butterflies and all manner of insects. Um, the other thing we've had is that. Um, Mentioned, someone mentioned Alexander von Humboldt's um, personal narrative, so the personal narrative of a journey to the equinoctial regions of the new continent, which was someone, you know, Humboldt went there very early on, um, explored in South America, and um, Hensler, I think, suggested that Darwin read Humboldt's personal narrative, and this is one of the things that inspired him to go, oh, I want to go and travel, I want to go and see these places. So just the idea of travel, and you know, he was interested in natural history but just, you know, make him actually wanted to go to those places and visit them. So I think that was pretty important. So someone mentioned that one. Um, a couple of other things, I guess, so Darwin had his own readings, uh, if you like, at Cambridge. Um, Herschel's gloomy discourse on the study of natural philosophy, which was explaining ideas of natural science as it was known at the time. And I think this was when Darwin said he wanted to contribute anything, just something to natural science. So he maybe wanted to contribute something to that. But also Herschel um, expressed the idea of experience as a source of knowledge. So because there was ideas that you know, in back in those days you didn't actually have to do experiments, you just had to read things and come up with a theory where he was saying, no, you really need to experience things so that you can you know, know about them. So that was, that was kind of an interesting idea, and so it probably helped Darwin wanted to contribute to some science. Um, and the other thing was Paley's natural theology, which, which Darwin read and was actually quite interested in, and had a, a, a sort of different explanation from what, um, what Darwin later came up with about um, how organisms came about, and he talked about design and those sorts of ideas. So Darwin actually did enjoy reading those things at the time, and it had some influence on him, but he would ultimately go completely against the sorts of ideas that, that Paley was suggesting. So, I'll just make a comment about that um, Darwin and his experiments, particularly mm-hmm. later in life when he did really detailed experiments with plants and how they move and so on and so forth. And these were particularly well thought out experiments and 
Um, he coined the phrase of a, of a control for an experiment, an experimental control. And so that, you know, we, it's, it's a contribution to science that is really not widely acknowledged to be you know, something that don't do, but the idea of doing a very careful experiment, one that can be interpreted, needs a control. And so uh, that was another contribution that he made to science. Um, and yeah, that's like a fundamental, fundamental designing experiment, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely fundamental. So, we thought we'd try one more uh, one more quiz. We've just got a quick one here. So we've talked about um, a few people who've been influential on Darwin. Um, we talked about his life and uh, his growing up and so on. So a few people we've picked out here. So obviously Henslow, um, Darwin's botany professor, but also you know really just interested in natural history and all all aspects of natural history at the time. Uh, so Darwin gave him with all sorts of questions and they had discussions and he became you know, the man who walks with Henslow. Um, Joseph Hooker, so he was a botanist, but he was a colleague, but also uh, you know, a lot of correspondence. They were, they were sort of good friends, you know, really. So and you know, some of his early ideas when he was writing about transmutation and so on, he expressed these to Hooker. Um, so he could tell them, you know, he needed a family involved, he needed someone he could talk to about these things or write to. Um, so he was important as well. Um, so Charles Lyell, we've mentioned, so he's reading uh, Dar uh, Lyell's Principles of Geology. That was very important, and also you mentioned Thomas. Yeah, I was just saying that thing about Lyell. I mean, yeah, yeah he read uh, Lyell's book while he was on the voyage, and so it got him to thinking about geological time, yeah. time frames. Yeah. But then when he came back, uh, almost immediately when he came back from the voyage, he was introduced to Lyell, he joined the Geological Society, and he, he and Lyell became also became friends, and so they, they were correspondents, and Lyle lived, uh, Lyle was older than Darwin, but he lived quite a, uh, to quite an old age, and they corresponded uh, as well a lot. Huxley, you know, he was called as Darwin's bulldog, and he was a staunch defender, and, uh, uh, and that's, that's read. Maybe I'll say a bit more after that, after the vote. Should we say what the people think? What have we got there? Yeah, I think I think Darwin was pretty excited when he must have been when he actually finally met Lyle. He felt like he was becoming a part of that whole society of, you know, of yeah. scientists or natural natural scientists at the time. So yeah. anyway, I would have been pretty busy. Okay. So what have we got? Okay. So, uh, so actually a lot of people are being low. Actually, not so much Huxley. Yeah, that's actually again yeah, I would agree with that. I mean I think Huxley was very important to the um, to the uh, sort of defending, this. defending it and sort of getting the idea out and defending it, uh, you know, uh, both publicly and and among scientists. I mean, but, but among scientists and to the broader public. But probably less important to, to this question is influential in his, in his ideas. So you know, whereas Hinslow, I mean, Hinslow uh, suggested him as the uh, going on the. Uh, as a naturalist for the voyage of the people, so if that hadn't happened, well, this life would have been yeah. very different. So he was pretty important, and then, as you mentioned, Hooker Hook was a sounding board, and they corresponded to literally thousands of yeah. letters exchanged that were sort of the text messages of the day, and when every day, you know, letters, and, and then we just talked about Lyle. So I think all three of those are important. Actually, it was important to the to the dissemination of the idea, but not so much to the uh, to the development of the idea. Yeah. And everything you need. Yeah. So someone's mentioned um, actually on the chat about Lamarck um, and his uh, philosophy, zoology. So Lamarck was a, was a Frenchman, and um, that's right. And he promoted the idea of transmutation and suggested uh, really for Darwin this idea that things could evolve. Um, so and I think Darwin definitely would have been aware of Lamarck. And so, again, he might have thought of um, that, you know, transmutation was possible at least, so the possibility would have been there. But the mechanism, obviously, that Darwin came up with was different to what... Uh, but look, Lamarck um, actually wrote on a whole range of issues, and I think just to pull out the whole, you know, quite characteristics thing is... He, he, and, and it's a really interesting book, actually, um, the, the um, Lamarck's, um, in English, we'd say, Philosophical Zoology. So, uh, okay, one last little quick quiz. Now everyone should be an expert by now. So quick quiz. Um, 
one or more polls. So in what year was the Origin of Species first published? So it's when it first came out. So um, what can we say? Darwin was 50 years old when it was published, so that, that might be a clue. So, um, and it was a bit over 20 years since he came back. So we're talking actually quite a long time between when he came back from the voyage and he started to write about transmutation in his notebooks, uh, 20 something years before he finally got around to actually publishing it, you know, as we'll see in part three, he got some provoking to his life from, from Wallace. So he originally planned a much bigger, I mean, it's a, it's a big book, but he's calling it, he refers to it as sort of the abstract, it's just a, a short version of what he really had planned to write. Um, and so that's, that's, that's part of the reason. We'll, we'll talk about next week and, and yeah. subsequent weeks, sort of what spurred him on to get it out a bit quicker and you know, end up with this four or five hundred page book instead of, instead of a two thousand page book. It's probably long enough. Um, so, okay, we've got most people have responded now, have we? Now, let's see what, what results uh, we got here. I think double, that's time up. I think the other thing I'd like to point out here is that the 150th anniversary was only a few years ago, wasn't it? 2009, yeah. yeah. So, so, what have people said? Oh, yeah, it must be done, right? The, and let's see what it says down here publication date. See that 1859, yeah. so pretty much everyone got that, didn't they? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, a couple more. Still pretty good. Yeah, most of people. Most of people got that. That's great. That means that everyone's learning stuff. So, okay, we're getting towards the end of the webinar now. So, um, just one other item from the forum. Someone mentioned um, the Mega Ethereum, and so. At Punta Alta in, in South America, Darwin found a, a whole group of um, fossil fossil bones, and actually of a range of different species. And one of these was Megatherium. Someone noticed that one of the photos uh, in the timeline wasn't a Megatherium, and what it is is actually a different species of ground sloth. And actually, there was a whole range of these ground sloths. Large, they were part of the, the megafauna at the time. Um, several genera, a whole, whole group of species. So Megatherium was just one of those, and these were one of the things at the time people started to find a lot more fossil animals and big fossil animals that they knew didn't exist anymore. A great big thing like a, a woolly mammoth or a mastodon or something, you know, you, you can't just miss those, they must be around. If they still existed, people would know they existed. So this was suggesting that, okay, things really have gone extinct. So there was a range of these. Um, so he's seen uh, megafauna, so living in the last couple of million years sort of thing. And so in Australia we had, you know, um, big fossil, uh, more fossils now, we had big, great big wombats, um, we had enormous, enormous goannas, mm -hmm. uh, as big as a crocodile, big as a small one crocodile. Huge kangaroos. Yeah, enormous great kangaroos, even bigger than the ones we see today. Um, Marsupial lion. Uh, and in various parts of the world there were these megafauna and a lot of them went extinct, probably only in the last, some of them only last 10, 20,000 years, yeah. so really in, in comparatively recent times. So, um, so that was just an example of something that, that Darwin did find and again would have made him think uh, a bit more about um, you know, what happened to these things. And yeah, uh, he was, I think he was surprised when he came back from the voyage that he, shipped, he found this almost complete skeleton and shipped it back. You know, and when he got there, it had been on display, and he was, he was sort of famous just for that one thing. And a bit of a celebrity. A bit of a celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny, yeah. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really, um, you know, raising people's awareness, I think. So, okay, just then, so we're getting towards the end now, I think. So just to, to conclude, really, um, so we've spoken this week about the, well, we've broken up into three phases of Darwin's life. Um, you could probably break it up into, into more phases if you like. Um, but I think just to really say that, you know, Darwin uh, really was a, a product of his times, so you know, partly his lifestyle, but you think about the intellectual climate at the time, I mean, we were all a product of the society we live in, and, you know, nowadays we use computers and we can search the internet and, and find information and touch the button. Um, Darwin had to spend a lot of time reading and pondering and you know, uh, writing letters to people and those sorts of things. So he, he did it in different ways. 
and we perhaps want to do that sort of research uh, these days. And I think also that Darwin's ideas have obviously affected a lot of the way we think in terms of how we think of ourselves, you know, as part of nature or um, you know the, the organic world. And, and really, it's, it's, it's revolutionised uh, biology in the sense that it just gives so much greater understanding of all kinds of biological processes. So, so the next week we'll get into the mechanisms of how that how it actually works, and uh, so a bit, a bit more biology, um, some history. Talk about the uh, not only Darwin's ideas, but all these other people's ideas, both before and since after Darwin, and so the evolution of the idea of evolution, and then you want to talk a bit, a bit about the mechanisms of uh, evolution by natural selection. Yeah. And so uh, there's a couple of uh, discussion forums for part two, so uh, by all means um, post, some, post some things on the, on the discussion forums, have a look there and see what people are saying to get involved, and uh, I guess we'll see you for the next webinar, which as I mentioned will be next Friday, and uh, we can talk about evolution and next natural selection and speciation and so on. Um, so same same Darwin time, same Darwin channel. Um, see you next week. And we'll just leave you with uh, this final quote from Darwin, an origin quote. Um, and we'll see you then.